my name is Emilia Demboy. I'm very happy to welcome you all to the very first session of a new seminar series, the CV's Gender Studies Lectures. Uh, and as you may know, CVIS is a university alliance consisting of 11 universities in Europe. And this seminar series, the CVIS Gender Studies uh, Lectures, is organized by a newly started network, the CVIS Gender Studies Network, uh, which brings together uh, gender studies researchers uh, in the member university. Uh, universities. And this lecture series uh, aims to bring together and to make visible ongoing gender research at the CVS member universities. It's organized monthly uh, and will rotate between the universities. And today the seminar is hosted by Stockholm University, where I am based, uh, and also our speaker, Malina King, whom I will introduce uh, in a few seconds. Uh, Stockholm University has a vibrant gender studies environment. There is research on gender and sexuality conducted both within the discipline of gender studies, but also in a wide range of disciplines that are collaborating in a network called the Gender Academy at Stockholm University. And we offer gender studies courses and programs from undergraduate up to PhD level. And I'm happy to introduce the speaker today. Uh, Dr. Malina King uh, is Associate Professor of Gender Studies at Stockholm University. Uh, she's PhD in, in evolutionary biology. Uh, and Malin has just published a book called The Female Turn, How Evolutionary Science Shifted Perceptions About Females with Palgrave Macmillan. And Malin will uh, tell us, uh, will be telling us about this book today. Malin will be speaking for maybe 35, 40 minutes, and then there will be time for questions and comments from you. And you can use, as Marcella said, you can use the chat. Uh, you can also raise your hand after the, after the speech, if you prefer that. So without further ado, I leave the, 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 the word to Malin. Thank you. I'll share my screen. So thank you for the invitation. It's such a, an honor to talk to all of these uh, different uh, gender studies people in different uh, universities in Europe. So today I will be talking about my book, The Female Turn, How Evolutionary Science Shifted Perceptions About Females. And uh, as I think you said, Emil, I'm at the Department of Ethnology, History of Religions and Gender Studies here at Stockholm University. And I'll just... So uh, my background is that I have a PhD in zoology. And so I'm an evolutionary biologist and I'm also a gender researcher. And I've been shifting between gender studies departments and biology departments in Sweden, US, Australia, and Germany. And I'm also a coordinator for the Gender Academy that men, uh, Emil was mentioning. Uh, I'll uh, show you a link to a seminar series that I'm organizing in the end. So what I'm doing is interdisciplinary gender and biology research. I've been working with problematizing the notion of biological sex as dichotomous and static. I've been making visible gender stereotypes and heteronormative notions in theory and practice in evolutionary biology and also beyond, for example, in textbooks on biology. Uh, and the last few years I've been studying the scientific process within evolutionary biology on sex among animals. So that is going into kind of feminist science studies. And so my first project, which I will be talking about today, is exploring how shifting perceptions about females in this field. Uh, it was funded by the Science Research Council uh, in Sweden. And uh, my second project which is ongoing is investigating a controversy over sex differences in evolutionary biologies about how and why different evolutionary biologists have different ideas about sex differences. And that is funded by Riksbanken's Jubileums Fund. So my 
uh, starting point is the feminist critique of natural sciences. Uh, criticizing the assumption that the natural sciences produce objective and value neutral facts. We cannot do the God trick, says uh, Donna Haraway, seeing everything from everywhere. We're not neutral and objective. Uh, and the natural sciences themselves are also cultural and social processes. So it doesn't matter if I, as a biologist, make a discovery, it doesn't become knowledge until the community of biologists acknowledge this as knowledge. So this is the social process in which knowledge becomes, is produced. And science philosophers and historians have shown that who is doing the science affects the knowledge produced. And therefore, all knowledge is partial, context dependent and also based in our lived experiences. And one example of this is that 100 years ago, it was a scientific fact that women had a limited amount of energy, they couldn't uh, uh, send the medicine, um, uh, they couldn't use uh, too much energy for their brains like studying, because then their ovaries will be shrinking. And that was one argument why women were not allowed to university. So this project, The Female Turn, uh, it's focusing on trying to understand how and why perceptions about females have changed in the field of evolutionary biology. Uh, through looking at controversies, the perception of new ideas about females, and the no negotiations about scientific knowledge. And as I said, it's funded by the Swedish Research Council. And I have now two publications coming out of this project. One is the, the, the book, The Female Turn. And the other one is a paper in Nature Communications called The History of Sexual Selection Research Provides Insights as to Why Females Are Still Understudied. So this shifting perceptions uh, it started out in the 1970s, and females have th these perceptions about females have shifted from stereotypic assumptions about females as coy and passive, and opened up for active female sexual strategies, and also shifted away from assumptions of monogamous females, that is, that female only mates with one male, and acknowledging that it's among animals, it's very widespread that females are mating with multiple males. It's also shifting away from assumptions of females as uniform and exchangeable towards investigating variability among females. And this shifting of perceptions about females is still an ongoing process, which I will be showing you. So I've been doing interviews with researchers in the field. I chose to interview pioneers, leading researchers, and also researchers with female perspectives, as they call it. Uh, and these are also overlapping categories. And uh, I've also looked into the scientific research, uh, re record of the field. So, uh, and quite early on, I realized that the histories I've heard from these researchers differed between the different animals they were studying. So I also tried to expand the, the different uh, taxa that the researchers were working on. And in the end, it included uh, researchers working on primates, birds, insects, fish, amphibians, uh, snakes, and spiders. So I have two different uh, theoretical frameworks that I bring together in this work. One of them is the epistemology of ignorance. It's also called agnotology. It's a study of how knowledge is ignored, delayed, or forgotten. And the science historian Londa Schiebinger, she says that ignorance is often not merely the absence of knowledge, but an outcome of cultural and political struggle. So with this, I bring to my project, so who knew and who did not know about active multiplicating females and why? The other uh, theoretical perspective I'm using is uh, the concept of situated knowledges by Donna Haraway. So uh, it's looking into the researchers' different specific ways of seeing uh, the, their partial context, the specific knowledges, 
based in their lived experiences. So in the social sciences and humanities, it's widely used uh, to acknowledge the researcher's social and cultural and political situatedness. Uh, but it's quite new to look into uh, the natural sciences, and it's not used within the natural sciences. Uh, but here I'm using it as an analytical lens to understand the different researchers' partial knowledges. And of course, I mean, Donna Haraway, she was using this to look into the situated knowledges of primatologists in her work on um, called Primate Visions in 1989. Um, so what I'm doing is combining this epistemology of ignorance and situated knowledges by looking into how ignorance is also situated. So how can we, what was it that prevented the scientists from engaging with female sexual agency and what spurred some scientists on to make the female turn? So I'll start with uh, talking about Charles Darwin and his theory about sex differences. So in 1859, he presented his theory about natural selection, about how small differences in traits made certain individuals uh, uh, survive better, and therefore how uh, species could change over time. But there was one thing that uh, was actually kind of disturbing with this theory. He couldn't explain how the beautiful plumages of peacocks or, or different kinds of birds how could these be explained by better survival? So in 1871, he presented the uh, theory of sexual selection in a book length uh, work. He actually presented it in his uh, natural selection book already in 1859. But anyway, so uh, this theory explains uh, or tries to explain how different uh, traits, especially male traits, uh, like different horns or, or uh, uh, these beautiful plumages have evolved despite their uh, perhaps worse survival possibilities. Uh, and he also describes the evolution of humans in this book. He describes women as morally superior, which is just in line with the, the ideology of Victorian society. But he also explains that the, the males are uh, men are intellectually uh, uh, superior to women. He says that this has been evolved through both natural and sexual selection because men have been fighting for women. They have also been fighting for survival more and therefore this has evolved uh, more in men. And although he explains in this book, uh, in big detail, the diff sex differences in many, many different animals. When he concludes and kind of generalizes his view about females, he says that uh, the male is a more active part in the courtship. The female, on the other hand, with rare exceptions, is less eager than the male. She is coy and may often be seen for a long time endeavoring to escape from the male. So in his generalization, he describes females as coy and passive. So, <clears throat> of course, Charles Darwin's understanding of females in sexual selection is uh, situated knowledge and situated in his specific context. And this is something that uh, Evelyn Richards has been describing in her wonderful book on Darwin and the making of sexual selection. So he formed this theory about evolution of sex differences, both in line with and against contemporary Victorian assumptions. Uh, it was very current, the woman question. So he argumented within his book on sexual selection against John Stuart Mill, who was saying that uh, women, if they had uh, the same opportunities as, as men, they would be able to make as good a work as they do and, and be as intellectual as men. Uh, but Darwin, as I said, argued against this. But on the other hand, he also describes females as 
somehow active because female choice, one of the mechanisms of sexual selection, uh, explains how the evolution of these beautiful male traits like the peacock's tail. Um, and this theory he came to with his knowledge about the bird, uh, the art of bird breeding and the theory, his own theory about the inheritance and also his personal experiences did not contradict these assumptions about women as coy and nurturing. Uh, so in more current times then, I found an early fem female turn in primatology. Uh, there was an influx of women into Western primatology in 1960s and 70s. And one of these pioneering uh, feminist biologists is Sarah Blaferherdy. She went to India to study langurs and uh, behavior that is called infanticide, that males sometimes, when they take over a group of females, they kill the youngest infants. And she described this uh, as uh, male sexually selected behavior, so that males could get more offspring by killing off these infants and thereby make these females uh, have their offspring instead. Uh, but Sarah, she she looked at these animals and she just felt with the female animals. She felt this empathy and she said, but how how can they live with having their infants killed once in a while, maybe every third year? Uh, why don't they do anything? So she also started to look into female perspectives and she followed the females and she found that actually uh, the females uh, she suggested that the females have their own uh, mating strategy by mating with many different males, both the ones within the group and outside of the group. Uh, they have this counter strategy to kind of blur the paternity issue so that nobody would know who is the father of their offspring. And thereby they could hopefully protect their offspring from being killed by incoming males the next time they, the group is taken over. She has also uh, criticized sexual selection theory for being very male focused in her book from 1981, The Woman That Never Evolved. <clears throat> and in 1986, she questioned the assumption of coy females in sexual selection. There's also a parallel history of Japanese primatology uh, in which they use uh, what they call a sociological method or uh, in which they try to understand the kind of whole species society and how the relationships between different individuals work. Uh, and they were very early to find female dominance uh, in Japanese primatology. They kind of didn't have these stereotypes about koi females. And they also found that uh, um, relationships uh, between females were very important for power hierarchies within um, Japanese uh, macaques that they were studying. So through these different interventions, perceptions about females have shifted toward including female agency, agency aggression and dominance. And there's another history in ornithology, the study of birds. So birds are often called the paradigmatic taxon of sexual selection research. And that's kind of the dominant uh, animal that they were studying. Uh, and female birds were assumed to be monogamous. Most birds, 90% of the species, a male and a female bring up offspring together. And, and live in, in social pairs. So that was the reason behind this assumption. But new molecular tools enabled the investigation of female multiple mating. And, and this led to a revolutionary shift uh, in which the supposedly monogamous females were shown to mate with multiple males. And one of the uh, researchers involved in this uh, is uh, Patricia adair -Gwati. And she pioneered in showing multiple mating in a socially monogamous bird in 1984. And she, when I asked her, she, she told me that she emerged as a feminist and a scientist simultaneously. 
and uh, her situatedness she talks about in terms of being a female. So I really am interested in female biology. I'm a female. I'd like to know more about that. Uh, she used feminist ideas, current uh, feminist ideas, to make hypotheses and theorize about female and male constraints and to test them in, in her experiments. She also pioneered the study of female aggression, and she's also made gender neutral models of mate choice. And she tells me that in 1984, when she presented this pioneering work on, on uh, female multiple mating in birds, uh, a, a famous uh, ornithologist told her, um, Steve Emlen, Patty, those females were raped. And, and she didn't believe in that. She said, really? Uh, because she knew they are passerines, uh, that's a small kind of bird. Uh, and even then, she knew it was hard to rape a passerine because passerines, they don't have uh, penises, but a mating is very quick and it, uh, it uh, requires the female to cooperate for the, for the sperm to be transferred from the male to the female. So at this time, uh, there were different perceptions about females, kind of the, the dominant perception of females as coy and passive, but then there were also these feminist biologists having another idea about active females. And then there has come to be a more acknowledgement of active females. So these initially androcentric explanations of female multiple mating, uh, that they were forced by the males or the territorial male was, wasn't able to keep other males away. Uh, these were questioned by another feminist ornithologist, uh, Susan Smith. And she thought that, you know, why would they mate, the females mate only in their home, home range? And why would they mate with any male that came into their territory? So she used radio uh, tracking to uh, follow females in the, in the field. And she showed that in these black capped chickadees, uh, the females actually seek extra pair copulations in territories other than their own and with males of a higher rank than their social partner. So this was one of the first studies showing that females were actively uh, looking for more males. Uh, so this is an example of a pattern I've found that I call male precedence. So it means that the research starts with a male-centric investigation or explanation and thereafter include the female-centric equivalents. Uh, and this is a kind of androcentrism. Uh, and in sexual selection research, this is, is partly due to biological patterns, for example, that these elaborate traits uh, that the males have is more common in males, like the um, peacock's tails. Uh, and therefore, it's kind of natural for the researchers to look into these elaborate traits first, and then look into females' elaborate traits, which are not as common. But there are other uh, examples which doesn't, which isn't explained by these biological patterns. And androcentrism is, of course, one way in which ignorance about females is produced in this field. But when it comes to insect research, they actually knew about female multiple mating uh, a long time ago. So when I interviewed entomologist Daryl Gwynn, in Toronto, he says that he cannot recall any resistance or skepticism to female multiple mating among the insect researchers that he was working with. Um, he said that we already knew that there were a lot of females mating with multiple males already in the 1950s because the research in ag agricultural research on pest control, they used the sterile male technique which is that you make a lot of uh, males sterile and then you let them out in the wild. And when they mate with the females, these they don't get offspring that um, because they, the males are sterile. 
However, this technique only works if the females are mating with one male, but if they're mating with several males, it's just useless. So already in the 1950s, they knew that in several species, uh, females were mating with multiple males. And also population geneticists had been studying fruit flies in the 1960s and came to the same conclusion. And there were also natural history observations. And here's another example of male precedence. The idea of sperm competition uh, came before uh, cryptic female choice, the equivalence. So uh, the, the, all this knowledge about female multiple mating in insects were the, was the basis for uh, Jeff Parker suggesting that males don't only compete uh, uh, before mating, they also can compete with different sperms uh, after mating. Uh, so this led to a research field focused on male-male competition on the gamete level producing large, uh, larger ejaculates, uh, mate guarding their females, uh, uh, and having organs that replace the preceding male sperm, like this dragonfly penis that you can see here. So when I interviewed Jeff Parker and tried to understand his situated knowledges, uh, he says that he was interested in both males and females, and he was focusing on individual selection. Uh, so uh, before his work, uh, it was actually in the field very much focused on group selection and uh, the idea that individuals was do were doing what was best for their species, but he was there and, and contributed to the shift towards looking into individual selection. And some of his papers were also focused on females. But he chose to study the yellow dung flies because he knew the species from his childhood and he was very fascinated by these fights between the males that were kind of obvious. Uh, and he also says that it's easier to look at the males and they're focusing on, uh, on the males. Um, and perhaps this is also due to his male perspective. But it, we should also remember that it's, it is totally in line with sexual selection theory and how Darwin described females as coy and passive. And also, it's interesting that this dung fly system that he was working with is actually dominated by male-male competition. And it also has a, a biological feature called a last male precedence, which means that the last male who's mating with a female uh, manages to fertilize most of the, the offspring. So it's very hard for the females in, in both before mating and after mating to have a say in, in who is fertilizing their eggs. So this uh, biological system actually focuses more on the male perspective. And then after that, the equivalent hypothesis of females influencing which sperm fertilizes their eggs after mating with several males um, came in, in 1983. It was suggested by uh, Randy Thornhill. Uh, he's also the author of The Natural History of Rape. So to me, it was a little bit of a feminist paradox to try to understand how come somebody who has been criticized so much by feminists for his uh, a book on natural history of rape in which he connects uh, the, I, uh, the, what he calls rape in insects with rape in humans and says that this could be an um, evolutionary strategy also in humans. Uh, how come he comes up with a female focused hypothesis? Uh, but when I talked to him, it, it made sense. It, it, he, his perspective is purely biological, and he's based this on his empirical studies on hanging flies and scorpion flies, in which he, on the one hand, saw what he calls rape, and on the other hand, saw what the females were doing. But he's always describing the females as active, how they avoid males without nuptial gifts, uh, how they manage to break free from males that attempt to copulate by force, and how they return to sexual receptivity quicker and somehow cause low insemination rate when they're forced mate. And in snake research, there has also been a shift. Uh, uh, Jesus Rivas, he was studying 
uh, green anacondas when he realized that in this species, uh, uh, females are mating with several males. And you can see that in the picture here. Uh, it's a breeding female with courted by 12 different males at the same time. And at this time in the 1990s, snakes were generally described as males mating with several females. This was the kind of mating system that they were uh, described as. Uh, but when he looked into the literature after his uh, discovery of the green anacondas, he reinterpreted snake mating systems as generally polygynandrous. That means that both males and females are mating with several, uh, with, with uh, both, with several uh, partners. So uh, in this classification of snake mating systems, female multiple mating had been overlooked in different ways. And an example from frog research is Mike Ryan. He has been combining neurobiology, behavioral experiments, and phylogeny, that is the family history of different species, uh, in trying to understand matures through the brain of the female. And by this methodology he's using, he emphasizes uh, female agency. And then lastly, in spider research, I interviewed Marie Herberstein in Sydney. And she says, there has been a long history in spider research of focusing on females. They're much bigger, they're more stationary, they're much easier to study. So spider research has from the beginning been more focused on females than on males. Uh, and there has been a lot of attention to the spectacular uh, sexual cannibalism in, in the spiders. And so she doesn't find that there is this gender bias against females. However, she finds that there is a taxonomic ignorance that spiders are seen as curious exceptions rather than good systems to test assumptions. So to summarize this uh, production of ignorance in sexual selection, I found this repeated pattern of male precedence uh, in, for example, the interpretation of female multiple mating in birds, uh, also in the example of uh, sperm competition and cryptic female choice. But I also found other mechanisms of ignorance, the loss of acquired knowledge in both bird research and in uh, uh, primate research. There are examples of descriptions of active females before this becomes a common knowledge and, and uh, within this, their fields. There are also practices of not citing, and there's also the undermining of authority of certain knowers. For example, in Western primatology, they used to not cite the Japanese primatologists because they didn't think their, uh, their research was uh, atheoretical and, and didn't follow the methodology that they thought was scientific. And also there's a widely acknowledged citation hierarchy or taxonomic in ignorance within this research in which research on about birds is on the top and research about insects and other animals uh, follow below and spiders are seen as exceptions. So everyone in bird research cite themselves or between themselves, everyone in uh, other, um, they cite the bird research, but there's very little research down in the hierarchy. And when it comes to gender and science, then uh, we know that through the history that the professionalization uh, of science excluded and marginalized women. Uh, and the, the progress of the feminist movement enabled women to participate in doing science. Uh, and in this study, uh, both women and men challenge assumptions about the passive females. Uh, so there is no direct relation between the gender of the researcher and being an initiator or proponent of female-centered hypothesis in this work. Uh, however, I did find that feminist scientists identified gender bias and expressed an outspoken strategy to investigate female animals. Uh, and I also found that there is a very big influence of the study animals uh, forming 
their researchers situated knowledges. Uh, in this uh, excerpt from an interview with uh, bird biologist uh, Marion Petrie, uh, she compares her own understanding of male-female relationships to the one of uh, Patricia Gowati. And she says, I think her, Gowati's perspective, comes from maybe working on a paired organism so that you've got a female, a male-female dynamic where there are shared care duties. Whereas for me, I'm left with wondering what the point of a male peacock is. They don't do anything. They're just quintessentially the useless individuals. So I don't sort of have a female resistance to male control dynamic in my own organism. And this, these different experiences of studying different animals form the researchers kind of questions and how they theorize about the uh, male-female dynamics in their species. And the research, uh, the researchers situated knowledges has been formed by their perspective as feminist or engaged in female perspectives uh, due to the particular methodologies, the DNA analysis, the radio telemetry they were using. Um, by the knowledge from other research fields, for example, for the insect uh, pest controls. Also the cultural context, the Japanese versus the Western primatology and the influence by the study animals have made these certain researchers particularly engaged in forwarding females as active, aggressive, variable and worthy of being studied in their own right. However, a discovery, as Helen Longino says, becomes knowledge after the critical reception of a community of knowers. So even though I find some studies early on that describe females as active, it, it isn't before we have this social and political context of the feminist movement, the sexual revolution, that this become a broader uh, knowledge within this community of evolutionary biologists. So new combinations of people, methodologies, theories, and study species have made this, enabled this shift, the female term. And therefore, a diversity in people, perspectives, and study species becomes, enables more comprehensive understanding of nature. There is still a continued ignorance about females uh, here I show uh, a diagram over sexual selection research in males versus in females. Uh, you can see the number of publications and this uh, on males, the green line, and the uh, on females, the blue line. So we still have much more research on, on the males than the females. Uh, this is an ongoing process. Uh, and the knowledge about sexual selection in females is still hindered by the assumption that sexual selection in females is much weaker or non-existent uh, by our current prevalent definition of sexual selection, which excludes many ways in which females compete for reproduction among themselves. Uh, and also there are practical reasons. It's often harder to study sexual selection in females uh, looking into their internal fertilization organs, uh, how females are moving in the fields compared to studying the males, uh, taking a sperm sample or, or something like that. And also our methodology for looking into these things haven't been as developed as looking into the male side. And we have this also uh, male precedence androcentrism in our theory. So uh, I would also like to uh, talk about my own situated knowledges, my ways of seeing. So this has all, of course, been formed by my feminist point of departure, my background in the field of evolutionary biology, the knowledge about the methodologies, the research, my research about variation in sex and sexuality, gender analysis of evolutionary research, as well as my expertise in feminist science studies. And this have all formed my research question about females in the field. And in the relation to the researchers I interviewed, uh, I'm a junior evolutionary biologist, also with a reputation of 
uh, being a feminist biologist. And this may have influenced who I got access to interview and what they chose to tell me. So this also influences my material. And from this, my position as an insider and outsider with these uh, feminist science uh, analytical tools, I've written this historiography about recent sexual selection from a gender perspective. Uh, so my contribution then to gender studies is that investigating knowledge production about sex differences is a core question in gender studies. Also by putting together in my analysis, the epistemology of ignorance and situated knowledges uh, is a contribution to gender studies. A lot of gender studies is uh, engaged in looking into knowledge that hasn't been introduced or, or how ignorance has um, uh, hindered knowledge production. So this is also a, a possibility of using this combination of analysis into other uh, studies within gender studies. It also demonstrates how the study animals are active agents in forming the researchers situated knowledges and it, it illuminates the interactions between society and the scientific process. And this is especially important now because biological and evolutionary claims about sex differences are gaining increased influence in political debates. And writing this history is also an, a negotiation of knowledge. I'd also like to uh, welcome you to uh, the Gender Academy at Stockholm University, in which I'm organizing the seminar series Gender, Gender Equality and Natural Sciences. It's often in Zoom or hybrid. Uh, I will also be arranging a PhD course in August about gender and biological sciences. Uh, it will be two weeks in, in August, and it's a good time to be in Stockholm in August. Uh, and I'd like to take the opportunity to ask you, because I'm doing a new study on feminist biologists. I'm looking for uh, feminist biologists doing research at the intersection of feminism and biology around the world. Uh, I make interviews about their experiences as researchers in biology or in gender studies and how they relate to the distinctions of social and biological, nature and culture or sex and gender. Uh, so, I'd love for you to send me names of feminist biologists in your countries uh, to this email. Uh, I'll ask Emil to share the slides afterwards. And if you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to ask them. Here are um, the links to my publications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pauline. Thank you for so generously sharing uh, and, and telling telling us about your fascinating research. Uh, so please ask questions in the chat, or if you prefer, raise your hand. We already have we have another thirteen minutes to go, if we like. Uh, we have one question in the chat. See if there are any more. Otherwise, I'll um, I'll ask it. So. Munib uh, is asking, are there any gendered situated differences in how the sexual behavior among insects, birds, snakes, etc., are extrapolated to sexual behavior among humans? Mm. Kind of hard to, I mean, of course, people are often drawing uh, connections between primates and, and animals that are closely related to us as humans, uh, but also uh, I would say in kind of popular science and, and uh, journalists often ask uh, people studying insects or any different species uh, to kind of extrapolate to, to what does it mean for humans. So uh, maybe that's something one could do research on. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Mihai Alexander asks you to send a, yeah, for the reference um, for the study that has analyzed the difference between studying male and female strategies, the graph presented earlier. But you, yes. you said that you would present your, or? Yes, it's part right. of the, um, I have put links into my uh, 
uh, PDA um, PowerPoint. So you can just, but it's this nature communications paper, uh, which I published last year. Thank you. Ingrid has a question. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for this uh, talk, which um, gave me the idea of how we should, and this is the same question that we already discussed, how we should extrapolate at all from animals to uh, humans, because my hunch is that at the moment we're in a game of my animal beats your animal, right? So I end up in many uh, discussions where people use the different animals they choose um, to prove basically any point that you might want to prove, right? So uh, um, at which point the whole exercise becomes um, itself political for starters, right? So the very gesture itself is already political. Um, and uh, also some somewhat uh, maybe nice for the discussions, but also somewhat then in the end misleading or not leading anywhere. How have you experienced this? Well, I, I think that, you know, um, we shouldn't take our morals from the animal kingdom. We can find examples of moral and immoral things. As you said, any political uh, party or any political point can be made by an example from nature. You, there's such a big range there. Mm -hmm. However, I think that in, in cases where um, people are saying like homosexuality is unnatural, that is kind of uh, common still, uh, we can find use it as uh, counter examples. I mean, a counter uh, argument towards those kind of unnatural uh, arguments um, and I mean even the the feminists uh, in the uh, 19th century uh, answering Darwin and and questioning uh, his uh, male focus in his theory and what that means for humans uh, they were also looking into you know uh, it's uh, the family patterns of fishes uh, as examples of, in this species, you know, there, there are just so much more possibilities than what we're now seeing in this Victorian society. Um, so maybe as utopian uh, for <laughs> examples of the diversity, of course. Thank you. That's how I see it. Thank you. You're receiving praise in the chat from Sally, and there's a question from Marcella. Yes, thank you so much, Malin, really for the very interesting presentation. It's an excellent start for our series of, of seminars. And by the way, I put all the links uh, in the chat. I say this especially for the students uh, while you were speaking. So even without having uh, the slides. I mean, you can start uh, looking uh, at the materials, just clicking in the chat to the links that I provided uh, while Malin was speaking. Um, my question is very simple and very difficult at the same time, Malin. What about orgasm? What about pleasure? Uh, what is the role of pleasure in this type of studies? I'm very ignorant about that. Um, so I would like to know if you can tell us something. Apart from mating, I'm talking about pleasure. Yes, yes. I'm. I said there's a, a wonderful um, study by uh, Nancy Tuana. Uh, she's been looking into the epistemology of ignorance about the orgasm and the pleasure for women, uh, and she says that um, you know in the in the uh, 1800s or was it 1700s when uh, the the orgasm was seen as uh, necessary for reproduction in humans then there was this uh, 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 the this researcher looking into how the the, the female clitoris was uh, used and how it was working and and trying to understand it However, when that was lost, when people didn't think uh, that the orgasm was necessary for reproduction, then uh, uh, the, the uh, clitoris and the orgasm was also ignored. So when in different uh, kind of textbooks about the human uh, anatomy, uh, sometimes they didn't even write out 
uh, or draw the, the clitoris and sometimes it's just an uninteresting knob. But it wasn't until then in the 1960s and 70s uh, that the women's uh, health movement who were interested in kind of uh, sharing knowledge about and, and discovering more knowledge about the clitoris and its use and its um, function that they were a kind of uh, a new interest and a new research being done on the clitoris and it's really late that we have become to know about the clitoris and also the same um, has been uh, shown within primate research uh, and and st are still nowadays uh, people are uh, discovering clitorises in the, the last uh, study I saw was about snakes. Uh, people didn't think there were clitorises in snakes. And now all of a sudden there's this wonderful feminist, uh, feminist biologist uh, in Mount Holyoke who is discovering all these different, looking into vaginas and, and, and clitorises in many different animals. So she, she found uh, clitorises in, in um, dolphins and she found them in snakes. Thank you, Malin. Uh, there are a few more questions. Maybe we won't have time for all of them, but but let's let's take at least one of them. Uh, so Lucia is um, uh, so so Lucia is writing that this presentation opened her mind uh, a new perspective about how every centrism we're studying are always relate, related to dynamics of power, which apparently include animal biology. And the question is. Uh, if this selective knowledge about female sexuality is affecting to this day the treatment of animals, for example, in intensive farming, breeding systems, zoo policies, and so on, uh, are in some ways the rights of female animals affected by this? Uh, I mean, in, in farming, in, in the animal industry, uh, female reproduction is uh, industrialized and, and explored, right? Um, does that answer your question? I'm trying to see the question here. Oh. Who was asking that question? This was Lucia Masanti. Okay. So there are two more questions, and I'll ask you to 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 answer one of them, to address one of yeah. them, if you if you, if you like. Uh, Aruki is asking. Uh, you previously mentioned about how female prevalence was overridden by scientists before. Could you please tell us more about the ways females predominated in history? And then there's a question uh, by Alessandro about the rise of incel subculture uh, and uh, whether you think there's a correlation between the rise of incel subculture and the partial but still ongoing rising of women's sexual freedom. Uh, if feminism in, uh, helped more women than men in the mating economy. Would you like to address any of these questions? Okay, the first one, uh, the female prevalence overridden by scientists before. Uh, I think maybe uh, this means uh, I said that in, in some of the early studies, uh, I could uh, find that females were described as active, but then uh, it didn't influence the kind of dominant view on females in that uh, community. So yes, there, there are such examples, both in bird research and in, in, in primatology. Thank you very much. And I put in the links here to both my uh, paper and my book. And just now there is uh, a discount. <laughs> so if you want to buy the book, um, there is uh, a discount code until the end of March highlights. But you, you can probably read it through your library. Just ask your library to, to uh, have it. It's, it's available as um, um, ebook as well, or you can buy uh, just one chapter or whatever. Thank you, Marlin. So 
If you want to uh, know more here, please check out Malin's publications uh, or get in touch. So thank you so much, Malin, for for uh, for uh, uh, starting off with a with a great start our seminar series. Uh, we're very happy to have had you uh, with us. Uh, next seminar in the in the CVS Gender Studies uh, lecture series will take place in a month on fifteenth of March and be organized by the University of Tübingen. And the speaker will then be Dr. Marian Müller uh, on, on the title, with the title, Dealing with Disrespect, How Women Attribute Experiences of Unequal Treatment. So we hope to see many of you there. And I wish you all a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you.